to start, I'm just going to clean up one edge on all of the boards. We'll now cut the boards into 60mm strips, those will form the sides of the box. And that gives me the pieces for the four sides. Now I'll start forming the groove that will accept the top and the bottom to the box. I'll just keep doing that to remove all of the material on this side of the piece of wood. Now I've set up the table saw to remove this piece of material. I'll do the same on the other pieces now. Now that I've cut the grooves in all the side pieces, I can now make a start on the motors. I need to measure 25 centimeters for the internal measurement. I always put a line in the direction that I need to cut the motor, just in case I mess up. I did exactly the same for the shorter sides, just with 19.1 centimetres as the internal measurement. Just testing the mitres to see how square I've got them. I think that's as close as I'm going to get it. Now what I'm going to do is put some pieces of masking tape over the backs of the joints. This is mainly to just help with alignment because I will add my band clamp on afterwards. I can now put glue in the joints. That's all square now, so I'll clean up the glue, squeeze out, and then leave it overnight to dry. Now I'm making a start on cutting the 7.5mm strips to make the top and bottom. You may notice I'm using my old table saw now because the mold from my newer one decided to give up halfway through starting this. So that's had to be sent off to be repaired, so I'll have to make do with this one. I'll repeat that now until all the boards used up. After finishing cutting that board, this is what I'm left with. I'll just edge joint these together now and leave them to dry overnight. In the end, I decided to just glue four of the pieces together. It still gives me enough gap around the edge. And this gap that I've cut at the moment, that will give me room to put in the arc inlay. I can always make alterations in case the arc is a bit thicker or thinner either side. I've cut the arc as best as I can on my table saw. I've got it to roughly 3mm thick. I then printed off an Apple logo onto some self adhesive paper and stuck that on. I'll cut this out on the band saw. And there's the finished logo. To help with alignment I've printed off another Apple logo but this time in a light grey colour. I've marked the centres of the blank board and now I've marked also the centres of all four sides on the Apple logo. So as long as those marks all join up I know the Apple logo is dead centred. I shall take the piece that I've cut, lay that on top of the logo 
trice round with a pen so I know that it's the tricing round the piece that I've actually cut just in case there's some differences to the original image and then I can router that out. I've installed the smaller straight cutting router bit I've got into my router and I've set the height or the depth of the router bit to match the same as the old inlay. I can now use that to cut out the apple shape on the top. Now that I've got that to fit, I'll work on the leaf part of the apple. Now I'll be able to put some glue on that and sand it flush. Now what I'm going to do is cut the box in half so I've got a top and a bottom. I've set the fence so the blade is exactly halfway between the top and the bottom of the box. I'll make a cut starting on the short edge, run that through, then the long edge, short edge again and finally finish up on the last long edge. Now as I run through the final lung length, I'm going to try and stop the two halves from pinching onto the blade. And that's the two halves now cut. I'll be able to clean up those edges with my sander now. These are the hinges I'll be using on the box. Them concealed hinges so when the box is closed you won't be able to know them there. I've marked out on the box lid where I'd like the hinges to go and I've followed the marks around using my set square. Those marks on the top I'll be able to use them as a guide for when I drop it onto the router bit and slide it along. I've also drawn lines on this back of board I've placed on my router table fence. They correspond to the edges of the router bit so we don't know where to start and stop the cuts. I have used a piece of scrap wood to try to see if I've got everything lined up correctly and the scrap piece 
is measured right so I know I can go ahead with my cut on the proper piece. So like I said earlier, I shall drop the piece onto the router be just before the line. I'll then slowly edge towards the line before making my way back to the other line to complete the first cut. And there's my first cut to start off the hinges. I'll do the same on all the other pieces now. I've now raised the rows a bit to enable me to take out the centre mortise for the main part of the hinge. I've done another test cut using my spare piece of wood. I'll now do the same to the other pieces. I've completed rotoring for the hinges now and it should just fit just snug. I've put a chamfering bit into my router and I'm now going to go around the outside edge. I could have used a round over bit but I think the chamfer bit gives it a more adult look. I've finished routering all the edges and I've sanded it by hand to 240 grit. I've took it out of the shed because of all the sawdust, I don't want the dust getting on the spray lacquer. I've brought it to my spray booth, otherwise known as my bedroom, and I'm gonna give it one good coat of lacquer. Leave that to set for about an hour before sanding it back again with some 320 grit sandpaper. To stop the bottoms getting covered with lacquer, I'm using an envelope to cover up the space. The box has now had 10 coats of spray lacquer, so what I'm going to do, I've got 1200 grit wet and dry sandpaper, I've got a bowl of cold water that I've got washing up liquid mixed inside. The washing up liquid really is just to act as a lubricant to stop the sandpaper clogging. If you're going to try this make sure you definitely use wet and dry sandpaper or else normal sandpaper when it's wet it'll just disintegrate and you won't be able to get the proper finish. I've just dipped the sandpaper in the soapy water. You just knock off the excess and then I'm using a light motion. very light and then feeling with my finger to see if I've missed any of the rough patches. The less work you do the better really because you don't want to go through the lacquer finish and down to the wood. A good tip is that if you see it building up a work, murky white you know that you're still in the finish. If you start to see the same colour as the wood you've gone below the finish and that part will be dull when you come to polish it up later. So I'll go all round the edges now. Be careful as well when you're doing the edges because that is so easy to go right through the finish and back down to the wood. So be very gentle when you're doing the corners. Just by running your finger over the wood you should be able to feel if there's any rough patches that you've missed. That feels totally smooth now, so I can move on to do the edges. I've finished sanding around all the sides now, so I'm going to work on the top and the base. You can use a block of wood and wrap the sandpaper around that to keep a more even surface while you're sanding, but I like to just use my two fingers, that way I can feel the exact amount of pressure I'm placing on. One thing I will say, you haven't got to go with the grain because remember you're only actually sanding the finish on top but when you decide which direction you're going to go in it's best to keep with that direction all the way through. That 
that's literally all it should take that feels smooth to the touch in there I can't feel any raised sections so I'll just dry that off with a piece of rag what I'm going to be using next is this product it's called rotten stone powder now traditionally you would be using pumice stone and then working up to rotten stone but I'm going to go straight to rotten stone I think it works just as well it might take a bit more elbow grease but it's also cheaper in the long run comes in this grey coloured powder and when you place it on it will go all murky and go to a black colour but it just buffs right off now you usually can apply it with mineral oil but I couldn't find any so I'm just going to be using baby oil it works just as well and it just it's just extra lubrication really and remember with a little lubrication anything's possible so all I'll do is I'll just cover the surface with some baby oil and then sprinkle on the rotten stone powder Now, I'm not sure if you can pick up on camera, this piece hasn't had any rotten stone powder applied to it. You can see how shiny it is, that's just from the lacquer and the 1200 grit wet and dry sandpaper. Now this piece has had the rotten stone finish. I'm not sure if you can pick that up, but seeing here, this is of course very shiny, but it's just got a slight haze to it, whereas this is starting to resemble glass. This is what I'm going to be using for the inside of the box. It's packaging foam. It's what's used when you ship parcels. Now, the firmness is just right. It's not too stiff and it's not too soft. It's a good compromise between the two. So I've cut two squares of it and they'll be glued together using spray adhesive to create the thickness that I'll need. And I'll be doing two sets of them, one for the bottom part of the box and another one for the top part of the box. And I'm going to be using some blue baize. This material is what they'll use to cover snooker and pool tables. It's a lot softer than felt, but it's the same kind of material. The adhesive I'll be using is for sticking carpets to the floor, so it's the strongest form of spray adhesive you can find. Now it's going to come out like white sea string, and I want to get a nice even coat all over the foam. As you can hopefully see, I've pressed that in now, and I've just, it's just a case now of pressing down firmly all around the edges, making sure it's come in contact with the wood on every possible surface. 